गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू गनर शॉट गनर शॉट में आज हम देखेंगे फाइव डेवलपमेंट्स विच आर रेटलिंग चाइना विद जनरल आता हसने सो लेट मी फर्स्ट वेलकम जनरल हसने सर गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू गनर शॉट वंस अगेन वी आर लिविंग इन इंटरेस्टिंग टाइम्स और एक बहुत अच्छी सब्जेक्ट है कि चाइना को हम हिला रहे हैं गुड इवनिंग जय हिंद नो डाउट दिस इज दिस इज समथिंग विच इज a uh, really uh, uh, something which the india has not really experienced uh, any time strategically in the past hey uh isse pehle ki hum you know china ke bare mein india china kis tarike se china ko hum hila rahe hain we'll take a detour to pakistan sir jaise aapko pata hai abhi gwadar ke upar attack ho raha hai aur wo china ko aur hila rahe hain wahan to you know take this account in uh, this thing of what's happening in gwadar by baluch uh, rebels what's happening in the north with you know pakistan carrying out air strikes and usse pehle ki ttp carrying out attacks in this thing so how do you read the whole pakistan situation and where does it go and how does it impinge on china i'd like a macro view before we get into our subject proper today look like it doesn't need any reminder that pakistan considers china or its relations with china as something which is higher than the skies and deeper than the oceans as you are all aware of it right and uh, it has invested a lot in this although the returns perhaps from china have not always been um, in consideration with the amount of investment that pakistanis have actually made in uh, chinese friend in friendship with the chinese But the chinese we are all aware of the of the uh, the special um, corridors which have been created etc the connectivities which have been done dependent on them to on pakistan to reach the warmer waters of the arabian sea to circumvent the whole problem of moving through the malacca straits what is called the malacca syndrome it is in china has re in, in turn reinvested a lot Uh, in 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 pakistan if you remember the china pakistan economic corridor 46 billion dollars in the beginning went down to 63 billion dollars and we used to hear about 90 billion and 100 billion dollars although all that has not actually materialized having said that the strategic relationship remains intact but there is of course a growing um, um resistance to chinese presence much of it is related also to the fact that the chinese have ill treated the islamic the muslim community in uh, xinjiang and uh, we have enough radicals of the, of our own in uh, in pakistan who are not too happy about it then there is the separatist element of the uh, baluchistan liberation army which is resisting this entire move of the chinese into baluchistan the occupation and construction of the gwadar uh, port you are finding 40% of the territory of pakistan occupied by 14% of the population being exploited hugely by the stakeholders in pakistan and china in particular because this gives it a strategic advantage of the area of gwadar chabahar and djibouti the famous triangle on which china is so hugely dependent of course i'm sure we will discuss how india is now Uh, making inroads into that as- aspect in particular so the anything which happens in baluchistan anything which happens against gwadar anything which happens against chinese interests in terms of chinese personnel the investments in this area etc always obviously impinges on the strategic relationship between china and pakistan and this is something which is a matter of interest to us so what we are hearing just today is this attack by the baluch liberation army uh, on certain assets in in gwadar casualties etc this is not the first time it's happened it is happening repeatedly and the ability of the pakistan army the pakistan security establishment to actually counter this entire thing neutralize it or put an end to it is highly highly questionable so this is this is the manner in which we can view it for the moment but obviously the china pakistan relationship although strategically still very strong is facing huge challenges within and okay, not only that sir i would like to add if you link it up with what's happening you know uh, in afghanistan 
and also reports that the uh, there are a lot of uh, assistance being given to the baluch rebels by the ttp and the afghan uh, you know militants so don't you see that this is going to be a recurring affair and pakistan state is going to have this major problem going on for a long time to come and that in turn is going to impinge on the china pakistan uh, relationship as a whole thank you for giving me that cue because the aspect of the taliban linkages obviously linkages with the ttp the tehreek taliban pakistan too the growing tide of a return of a radicalism in the area in the region of afghanistan and towards the west of it not entered into our areas yet but in those areas the potential return of a second cycle of global terror which we have been talking about in the recent past all these put together actually put into a crucible acts as a huge threat to pakistan right and and, and this is the very strategic area the area of the the, the border with uh, iran the border with afghanistan obviously with all this pressure on the western borders the eastern borders with with india comparatively would you see far less attention than what pakistan would have otherwise like to do so to that extent definitely it is in our interest to and it dilutes to a great extent the relationship between china the potential aspects of the relationship between china and pakistan because at some stage the chinese are definitely going to question the pakistani capability to be able to define or to defend the assets that have been created in gwadar and and question them on this so obviously an element of embarrassment to pakistan perhaps that is the issue which we should be looking at oh thank you sir so you given us a picture where pakistan is going to be in lot of pain and this relationship is going to be uh, you know diluted i won't say diluted at least under tension resulting we are going to get a great window of opportunity to do what we have to do and progress the way we want so having said that we'll see how this goes on if we, it warrants a further discussion we'll get back to it sometime in another episode but i'll now get back to our main thing things which rattled five things which rattled china first i'd like to compliment you sir for the excellent article you wrote on you know in the in new indian express i know it's your fortnight fortnightly column all of you who are watching this please read this article it's extremely well put out and in this general hasnain has put out a few things which have rattled uh, china and we discussed there are a few more things which are going to come in and we thought we'll today discuss five issues which are rattling china right often we think that you know we don't do enough against china but we don't know what we are doing that is why we are getting it into the focus so that you know that there's a big pushback against china as we rise what are these recent opening of the sela tunnel by a prime minister rebalancing of forces there was news about 10000 forces being rebalanced and you know whether it is correct wrong etc all that there's a different thing then we fired the agni file then we have put up the ins jetayu at minikoy and we are carrying out anti piracy operations so i'd like you to first touch on the rebalancing and then we'll get into sela tunnel because i'm not going to get back about rebalancing later first about the rebalancing thank sir thank you for having identified these from my article and adding to it the intent behind my writing this was that i don't think in the public people were joining the dots they were looking at each of these uh, developments individually and not understanding how big a pushback actually all this is so while this rise where the rise of india is taking place is not taking place too rapidly it is happening but uh, simultaneously we should we must always remember that the chinese their interest is always to impinge on indian strategic interest prevent our rise at any cost until they have to some extent at least resolved all their borders or all their problems in the south china sea etc they don't want india to become a major challenge against them they think that india with its rising economy with its defense capability with new addition of new technologies the modernization of the indian armed forces all this happening under this government at the moment 
is giving the potential for India to rise to a level where it can be actually a serious contender, a serious challenger to China. So that was the whole idea behind it. To come back to the specific question on rebalancing. You see, there was a report uh, from Global Times, uh, from various sources in China, etc., that 10,000 troops have been added to the line of actual control. Now, as far as my information is concerned, and I think all of us understand it full, fully, India has just about got adequate infrastructure constructed. It's taken us the better part of two to three years. Constructed along the line of actual control. It's well manned, well constructed. We have got our habitat there. We have our ability to stock, etc. I don't think there's a scope to enhance that strength, at least under so-called no war, no peace conditions. In a hot war situation, it would be a very different thing where you, under any circumstances, you would push in reinforcements, etc. 10,000 troops have not really been added. What has happened is this is a misreading by China. We need not be explaining to them at all. But this has been a misreading by China because a little bit of re or batting is taking place. You know, we have, we have had to pull out troops when we reacted in 2020, April, May. We pushed in troops from other portions of Northern Command. Those have gone to their various locations. Headquarters, which were also pulled out on an ad hoc basis at that time, are now being formed in into various areas with their response, uh, with, the, with their responsibilities being given to them. And that is why you are repeatedly finding, and this is not something unusual in the army, Indian army particularly, where you find this kind of reorbiting taking place all the time. Right? I mean, we know it in uh, Northern Command in particular, which is a very active command, that this keeps happening. Troops came in and out, keep happening. The Chinese have obviously misread this whole thing or intentionally misread it to try and project that India has intent, which is not very peaceful, not there to find a solution to the LAC issue, not that the Chinese are showing any propensity of finding a solution to the LAC issue either. But they are saying, see, you are adding troops to the LAC and at the same time carrying out the meetings on the, on the border, which is against the whole spirit of peace. Now, I think India has adequately given an answers on this. And if nothing else, through the media, we have given answers. Even if India has not officially given an answer, we have given adequate answers on this. Oh, I agree with you, sir. We are, while we this thing, but the important thing is that they are misreading us and they are rattled. No, no. And they in no their doubt. perception, no, no. They, they are, they are so they are rattled. Rattled. that we have shown the capability to add more troops to build in add more troops and build infrastructure. That is what is rattling them. Yeah. What is important? And so, despite all their big talk and info war and propaganda and all that, China also can get rattled. That's the big message which we want to today put across to everyone. So, let, let's get to the Sela Tunnel. See, I'd, I'd like to show you a, a clippings. And this has come from uh, South China Morning Post about four or five days back. He says, China has protested against India tunnel opening once it will only complicate the border issue. So it pinches them. Now, just to put everyone in context, this is the Sela Tunnel, a picture of the Sela Tunnel at, as it was opened by our Prime Minister, right? And it is a major thing. And again, if you see what the Sela Tunnel, it's, agar, you know, you have a look, that red line which is going up from Rangapara, it goes up to Bhumla. That is the one major artery which goes from the plains of Assam to the, uh, you know, LAC. You see Tibet, Bhutan, and India out there. And you see the marking of the Sela Tunnel. I'd like just to explain to you, the dotted line is the Sela Massif. And that Sela Massif is over 16,000. The crossing is only at Sela, which is also at about 14,000 feet. And there are no other crossings in this area. And this a tunnel here, and this tunnel is good about 1,000 feet much below the, uh, you know, the existing Sela Pass or the road over the Sela Pass. This gives us an all-weather capability to take our troops from south of Sela to north of Sela. So, sir, I'd like you to give uh, your view and, and your strategic implication of this whole thing. And how does it rattle China? Because we are still talking of rattling China. 
I think we need to keep this map on while we are speaking. Yeah, I will. It's a very try. important and a very well-made map. Uh, I am from a battalion. I hope you also know it. <laughs> Fogadwal Rifles. I know, sir. Which yes, has got the battle honor of Jaswandagar. With yes. the battle Kaila, of your, your, covering troops. Your battle, your unit was also part of the Kaila garrison. I remember that. That's right. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. We got we got this battle honor at a place called Nuranang, which is approximately Nuranang, yes. 11 to 12 kilometers north of the Sela Tunnel. Yeah. Uh, or rather the Sela Pass. We had we performed yeah. the, the, the task of covering troops and fought, defeated the Chinese in five attacks that they had made. Why I'm telling you all this is because this is a very important area. Now, if you want to actually defend Tawang, you must have Sela under your control. Because, uh, you know, otherwise Tawang is lost. If Sela is lost, Tawang is lost. Because you have to descend into the Jung re-enter, you know, the, into the, descent, the, the, the Jung River area Tawang down River. below, climb up to Tawang, then come to Bumla. Now, those who are, perhaps who would understand it in another way, if you look at the place where Tawang is written very faintly, north of this is a place called Bumla. That's the pass. The Chinese also fought with us there in 1962. Beyond Bumla, you have reasonable, not rolling plains, but there is a drop in heights, comparatively easier terrain. Therefore, the Chinese find it much easier to construct their infrastructure on the other side. Very unlike our area. Our area from Tawang, you come down to the Jung River, come up to the Sela Pass. Then from there, you come right through all this difficult terrain, all the way down to Tenga and beyond, right to Rangapara. To Rangapara. So, you see, the problem here is, has always been, first of all, winter connectivity, which means that you have to stock up in Tawang. Uh, well, in summer, run your convoys, etc., as you do in some other parts of in Northern Command too. And uh, also in the case of hot war, should a hot war situation develop in the period of winter or just close to spring, when you find that the Sela Pass is not open, when the road, because the Sela Pass closes down in late October, early November, opens up only in March or April later on. Now, if that happens, how do you push in troops? The only way you can do it to Tawang is through a helibone, uh, through helicopter lifts. There's no other way that you push in troops there. So, the Sela tunnel which has been constructed is one of the most strategic tunnels. Exactly like the Zojila tunnel, which is under construction in between Srinagar and uh, Leh. Hopefully, it will, be, it will get inaugurated in the very near future sometime. So, this is, a, this is a game changer. The Sela tunnel is a game changer. Now, 24-7, 365 days of the year, our convoys can run all the way to Tawang and beyond. And we can stock that area. We can reinforce that area. We can deploy as we wish. Otherwise, we were restrict restricted primarily by General Winter. As you know, what happened with Napoleon way back before Waterloo, sometime in the early part of the 19th century. So that is what has been defeated by the construction of the Sela Tunnel. This is what rattles the Chinese. Now, and our the capability. Yes. Yeah. yes, sir. Please, sir. Our yeah. capability to now fight is obviously transformed. Besides all the other technologies which are coming up, which we will discuss subsequently, we find <laughs> our ability to fight on ground has increased manifold. With the, you know, with this coming up of this tunnel, we can deploy in all those correct in those deployment areas without being constrained by logistics, without being constrained by ammunition, dumping, etc., etc. This is the one of the major things in this which has happened. Yeah, yeah. and not only that, uh, China is even more rattled because the Prime Minister made it a point to go and inaugurate this tunnel. Absolutely, and absolutely. That is because also the presence of the Indian Prime Minister in Arunachal particularly rattles China because they lay claims to Arunachal Pradesh as southern Tibet, as we are all aware as southern Tibet and do not like to have visits of any particular senior functionaries, etc. So far, we've had earlier maybe the vice president of India going there or the chief minister going there. The prime minister going there obviously conveys a message. And that too at such an important time. Elections are going on in India. 
I'm not saying that Prime Minister Modi is playing to the masses by going there. He is conveying a strategic message. The construction of the Sela tunnel and he going there is obviously showing that our claims to Arunachal Pradesh lay firm. And we will defend Arunachal at all cost. We will continue to ratchet up our infrastructure out here. That is our choice. Because we are an independent nation, a self-respecting nation, which will defend every inch of our territory. Yeah, I think we are very clear, sir, how Arunachal, how Sela Tunnel is a game changer. And this, having served there, like you, I have served there, sir. And I have actually lived in this Nuranang for over 15-20 days at a stretch because uh, Nuranang at that time and even now is a big ammunition dump. Yeah, dump. And as a young major, I used to look after that. And our ammunition used to be stocked there. So I have also fond memories. I've been to Jaswandgarh. Uh, like your unit, my unit also has a memorial out there, Five Field Regiment, where, you know, and all these memorials now are at a place called uh, Nukmadong under Foco. So I think it's a good thing. And we have a historic claim to this area, uh, you know, uh, roots to this area. And the fact that this area has now completely changed. It's a game changer, which I thought everyone must know. Okay. The next thing we're going to talk is about the base near Maldives. We all have heard that, you know, uh, China is now getting into a military deal with Maldives and we are getting out of Maldives and all that. But we have just opened INS Jatayu on Minicoil. So again, sir, I'll put it up in context in the maps and then I'll uh, put your thing. This is Minicoy and Jatayu. And to explain this, if you see, this is the Indian Ocean. In the center of Indian Ocean, you see a dotted line. That is the Chagos Archipelago. The southern end of the Chagos Archipelago is Digo Garcia. The center is Maldives. The northern end of the Archipelago is Minicoy and Lakshadweep. Minicoy is our island. This is ours. Now, any passage through the Chagos Archipelago is not free. It has to go through certain channels. And which are these channels? Let me explain it to you figuratively. If you see on the left, between Lakshadweep and Minicoy is the 9 degree channel. Between Minicoy and Maldives is the 8 degree channel. This is where the bulk of the international uh, shipping goes through and in Minicoy today you have a base and in Lakshadweep also you have a base so that is two things and if you look to the right the Andaman Nicobar in the end you see between little Andaman and Nicobar you have the 10 degree channel which is the you know equivalent thing now to put this whole thing in a map you see the 9 degree channel the red dot is Minicoy south of that is the 8 degree channel and the 10 degree channel now, this gives you actually a control of this entire area. So, all yours now. See, um, PR, what is important is to remember that China, its uh, entire growth has been based on a free run of the sea lines of communication. Uh, it's got its energy from West Asia freely through these sea lines of communication, through the Straits of Malacca, going up to the western seaboard of China. That's where all the all the manufacturing has been done in Shenzhen and places like that, Hong Kong, the, that coastline. 14% growth which the Chinese achieved at one time, right? And an average growth rate of 10%. This All this marvel happened because of the free run that China has had through all this area. Unthreatened, absolutely. Now, suddenly... They realized, they realized this very early, that they wanted to continue this free run. They must not allow India to have a total control of its territory, the, the neighboring territories. That is where the famous theory of the, uh, of the, of the strings of pearl, uh, string of pearls can, uh, came yeah, up yeah. some years ago, right? And you've seen from Sri Lanka to Bangladesh and all around Bhutan, Nepal, Pakistan, Say, not Seychelles so much, but um, uh, Maldives, the, Sri Lanka, coming back to Sri Lanka, all this attempts by China have been going on over the years to cultivate their influence there. Fortunately, Sri Lanka, a very important uh, country for us, 
at the moment, even otherwise strategically, has uh, not fallen for this. And despite the fact that uh, they had a whole uh, Chinese port uh, constructed here, you find that uh, the Chinese influence has waned. India has come to the support of Sri Lanka in this uh, moment of crisis when we forwarded that $4 billion support and assistance to, uh, to Sri Lanka. All this has made a difference. So primarily, the Chinese are looking to ensure that the Indian Navy and given the fact that the Indian Navy is on home ground here, does not have the capability to be able to battle the future PLA Blue Water Navy. At the moment, the PLA Navy is also not a Blue Water Navy, but they look at the future. And they want to continue this building the strings of pearl here and making sure that their influence is intact and somehow or the other keep badgering India, keep influencing our, our neighbors around us to prevent our hold over this area. Now, you've explained it beautifully through this, the, the active sea lines of communication. When Muizu, Muhammad Muizu, thought he had carried out the biggest coup d'etat of the world by asking uh, the Indian or the 80 personnel or 90 personnel of the Indian Armed Forces in, in uh, Maldives to, to be evacuated from there, by given by a date, I think 10th or 11th of March, it was something like that. He thought he was doing the biggest thing, right? Not realizing that we have a capability far beyond that. Actually, what he lost out is uh, a tremendous strategic relationship which he had here. His fresh water, when they ran out of fresh water, it was India who provided the fresh water to Maldives, right? Now you find suddenly that uh, we have lost influence. And I still feel it is only a very temporary thing. It's, we've lost influence in the Maldives at the moment. Come a few years, we will regain it again. These are the efforts which are going on at the moment to make sure that there's a proper pushback in the Indian Ocean area. You see, we have we constructed, we made the Andamans and Nicobar Command way back in 2001. The first uh, theater, uh, virtually theaterized command at that time. It had the capability. We have not given it the full capability. I'm sure we will ratchet it up much more. Everyone is aware of the Malacca syndrome, which the Chinese suffer from, fear tremendously. Given an enhanced capability to the Andaman and Nicobar Command, you can block off the entire PLA Navy in the area of the, of the Straits of Malacca, right? Now, the Chinese are obviously carrying out a lot of, you know, muscling in the area of the North and the West uh, Arabian Sea primarily the areas where today the Indian Navy is carrying out a tremendous amount of operations. They feel this is a very important thing for them to maintain their energy security because it's from West Asia that most of their energy is coming. So they feel that connecting, connecting West Asia down to the Maldives and from here to the 10 degree channel, etc. If this is absolutely free of Indian influence, Indian control, then the Chinese sea lines of communication are all intact. That's not happening. With our moving in here and constructing our infrastructure and facilities in the Lakshwadeep and Minikoi, at the moment, this is only the beginning. I would say this is only the beginning. As this ratchets up a little more, you will find similar things happening to a greater extent in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands and all around these areas where we have friendship, influence with most of these countries around. It's just a very temporary thing, I think, with the Maldives that we are seeing a you know, some sort of a setback here, which will all return in due course. Yeah, I would like to add a few issues sir, in this. If you see in the south, the southern part of the Chagos Archipelago is the Diga Garcia base. Now, if you see in the right, Lakshadweep, we have a base, Monmikoi, we have a base, Digo Garcia is a US base. And then, of course, you are on the uh, eastern side of uh, the eastern uh, Indian Ocean, we have the Andamans. Uh, command. On the western, near Seychelles, we have the Agalega Island where we have already established naval facilities. Virtually by doing this, we have actually started controlling complete the Indian Ocean region. And if the Americans kick in with their help, which is almost, you know, uh, in their interest also, we, we actually can make life hell for China. And I think that is why the reaction comes from China. The rattling That's which we the, speak about, yeah. The rattling we speak about. So, if you now connect it with the 
sailor tunnel you connect it with the rebalancing which is going on you see a you know a great pushback look at it from a chinese point of view he thinks we have developed some capability offensive capability across the central sector sailor tunnel opening up 24 by 7 makes it a no go for him there on the other hand he might even perceive offensive from the indian side i mean we have to think like the chinese and he is getting bottled up here he now either 9 degree or 8 degree channel either side is being controlled by india the 10 degree channel is controlled by india you don't have to go and just block malacca straits you can if you block this which is well within your territorial waters then there is a lot of problem which we can get to the chinese and that is what rattles them and add to that the fact that we are there at agalega also so I anything add, more you want I to add, add just yes, sir i may add one thing here thank which is important also today's visit of the prime minister to bhutan yes sir we can't very important it's a very important country the only two countries which have not resolved their borders with china are india and bhutan right and uh, bhutan has been under tremendous pressure from china to try and make sure that they don't want, don't get influenced by us on the whole issue of dolam if you remember in 2017 yeah, and, yes, sir. bhutan has held on bhutan has held on although we found a propensity once in a while of getting influenced here and there but they've held on now i think this is a very very important strategic moment the visit of the indian prime minister to bhutan and conveying a very important message to everyone we will we will retain and look after our interests completely come what may and yeah, not only that sir in bhutan is also now shown like you said they are also not very keen to uh, you know go ahead with china unless they are clear that india allows them and the kind of trade in terms of electricity because our hydel projects there actually contribute to 40% of their economy i mean this is something which we don't know and I, having served in that area uh, in the early 80s and you go there today in the east northeast the northeast is power surplus because of the power uh, infrastructure we built in bhutan and they also want uh, a trading post and uh, scz to come along the southern bhutan along assam in this area of samdrup jonkar that's also something which is on the cards so taking all this into consideration i think china has tremendously you know has tremendous reasons to worry about how india is going in this entire area uh, anything more you want to add sir i want to switch to arni which is the uh, no, next point. i i think we have discussed a lot on this entire aspect of the maritime zone but we need to just remember there is a deep connect between the maritime zone and the himalayan zone himalayas that's the, the thing himalayas the himalayas as such because the, i have always believed you know this this is a very interesting theory of the uh, the the strength of the maritime zone and just the strength of the continent what is called the continental versus the um uh, the maritimes the maritimes uh, the, uh, options right the chinese would always like to keep us under pressure on the himalayan belt on the continental belt as such to try and make sure that we are forced to put our focus of our defense there of our security and strategic you know focus on the, that area and not in the maritime zone which is the area where they fear us the most right most. now you are finding that india has got a push back in the on the continental zone in the continental area too and both sides in the maritime and the continental this push back is rattling them huge hugely and it will i mean i have no doubt about it whatsoever and just to you know to put things on the, the other perspective is the missile programs this is the clipping from the global times the missile i mean you know they look at it as the indian missiles program indicates it's an imaginary enemy harms regional peace and stability and all that but they forget that it was you know after all they also done a whole lot of tests and india is you know got everything so we need to do what we have to do for ourselves We but let me not be apologetic the, about this at all. In fact, at all. something a lot of people feel reasonably apologetic about this. We needn't feel apologetic. We should tell the Chinese very clearly: you have you lay claims to southern Tibet, 
but you are constructing all that infrastructure through Gilgit Baltis Baltistan, an area which is legitimately belongs to India and that everyone knows. China knows it very well. Too, right? So I think this is a pushback which is taking place at a very correct time strategically. I think so, sir. So let's just see what about Agni. This is the Agni three-stage intercontinental ballistic missiles with MIRV capability. MIRV to just to expand this multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles. These are, uh, you know, in the warhead, it is there. These uh, vehicles could be two in number, three in number, up to ten in number. In these inset, I've shown it, it something more you could have. Now, each of these can go. And once they go into the exosphere, into the atmosphere, they can re-enter independently and hit three different targets, as I've shown here. So that gives us a tremendous capability. That and means you can have miniature... Uh, targets can be as much as 1,000 to 1,500 kilometers apart. Kilometers apart. So that gives you a tremendous capability. It also... if so, Just think, if you have 10 of these warheads, and they're going at you know at 10 different targets 1000 kilometers apart you can't even track them you can't track all of them you might you know get eight of them down at least one or two will get through and that's more than enough in terms of deterrence right so it is a decoys. Huge... what is mentioned decoys. is that they act as decoys virtually decoys. to the missile system yeah so these are things which are you know, which puts us at par with some of the top countries in the world. And to just put perspective, I just did this of a Google map, Google measure tool from the center of India. Where does 5,500 kilometers go, which is supposed to be the range of Agni? Where does it go? It goes to the northeast corner of China. So your views on this Agni and how it, how it will rattle China and which you've written about. Yeah, say, PR, what we have to be clear about is there is no necessity of a strategic balance in terms of numbers. No one has yeah. to look at that you have got 100 missiles and I therefore need to have 100 missiles or I need to have 100 warheads and you've got 100 warheads. You may have 100 warheads. I have the capability to launch one missile with 10 warheads. That is strategic balance. You are achieving your balance. Because nowhere in in a nuclear in the nuclear parlance, no one is looking at nuclear war fighting. If it comes to war fighting, if I get ten targets and you fire two missiles and get my ten or twenty targets, we are on equal balance, right? But that war fighting will hardly ever come. So it's all a question of deterrence. So if you have the capability to have one missile with ten uh, ability to fire on ten object on ten targets, you have a strategic balance here. Now this is something which was missing. All this time, 5,000 to 6,000 kilometer range, which we have achieved and the fantastic plotting which you, which you have done, I think should convey a very clear message. Although a lot of people are saying that a single test should not be taken as something which is confirmed. But obviously, a single test is something which will lead to the second and the third and the fourth test, which will happen fourth in rapid succession, I'm sure, in the near yeah. future. You have demonstrated a technical cap capacity, capability. That is the important message which is going. It's not just missile technology. It's not just the question of MIRVs. You are demonstrating an overall technology and your capability. This is what should be rattling China. And, you know, in this game of deterrence, nuclear, no nuclear war is going to be fought. No nuclear war will be won, right? Whether you fire one nuclear war or ten nuclear war, it's, it's all the same. What is important is the threat in being. The ability to convey the threat, right? It is not the execution. Execution kisne deka. But the fact, this little arrow, anyone, all of you can put this, you know, thing of 5,000 kilometers and see where it goes. And anyone in China will also see it. And now we'll know that if he can target the southernmost part of India, so we can we, right? So there's the balance which General Hasnain was talking has come about in a very, very, very clear manner. And that is something. So now we have spoken of a continental pushback. We have spoken of a maritime pushback. And now we are talking of a nuclear pushback. And we will now go and see operationally how things are being handled in the Red Sea area. All of you know that in the Red Sea, right, 
you i've shown you the here the cape of uh, you know the uh, not the uh, you know horn of africa the Re, you know the babel mandeb the red sea and of course the strait of hormuz we all know that there's anti piracy operations going on in this area and as of today there are 10 to 12 ships of ours indian navy carrying out anti piracy operations very successfully in the red sea area it is the i won't say the multinational forces the international forces of you know uk and us who are battling the houthis here in djibouti they china has a base and their ships are operating from here in the past 3 months we have not heard of one chinese ship doing anything either against houthis or against the pirates and we must understand you know this is a very great thing which is happening which i we must understand at this time the chinese and the pakistani navy just in october uh, no, not in october in december did a major exercise called the sea guardian and all this is a base there and doing exercises here all is to get operational experience and yet when the time has come for operational experience and carrying out operations they have run away okay and here in lies the difference now you have a operational edge you have demonstrated operational edge internationally that indian navy is capable of handling operations prepared to you know help the world out you are projecting your power if this is not projection of power what is and on the other hand china with all its capabilities has hidden its power it's not even able to project its power so all yours your views see, see, general pr <laughs> the important thing that we need to remind our viewers is that for the last many years the pla navy has been extremely active in the south china sea it's been uh, banging into the <laughs> into the various naval vessels of indonesia of philippines and things like that they seem to be adept at that kind of a thing you know banging uh, strategy but when it comes to the real bang when it's required here when you need to come to the, of the world at that time that bang doesn't seem to be any way i don't want to sound provocative on this unnecessarily but i do want to remind the people and i hope a lot of people around the world will see this that there's only a single navy which is actually holding forth the responsibilities of the international community in this zone here you have got a maritime coalition here which of which we are not a part they are here of of advanced countries great powers but they have not displayed the propensity to be able to achieve what the indian navy has achieved their marcos their uh, naval aviation their ships themselves all i mean all domains and all dimensions of indian naval power are are very much visible there active there and highly successful there we keep hearing about this great triangle of chabahar uh, gwadar djibouti and this is the area through which the chinese uh, the pla navy would like to you know protect its interests of uh, particularly the energy interests that the energy which flows out from this area etc they are there for themselves they are not there for the international community when is the chips are down and the international community international shipping requires you where are you that's the question we should be asked from them and i think they should therefore the world should understand that here is another nation with an economy six times weaker comparatively which is on the growth path of course but at this stage is self willing to risk it willing to project its power and in comparison a much weaker navy compared to many other powers which are there at the moment but with the guts to be able to go there and deliver that's what the international community has to understand and i'm sure those who are looking at this this is live sci warfare in a way it should be affecting the minds of the pla navy it should be affecting the minds of the military leadership in china here is a nation on the growth on the growth path which is willing to risk if required for the sake of the international community yeah and we have gone nearly 2000 kilometers away chinese navy has not been able to cross china sea they are still stuck within the first chain of islands and that's where their superpower is and it also goes to prove something which is which uh, general hasnain did touch about 
in this game in military parlance and when it comes down to operations the gdp doesn't count the gdp is a figure what counts is what you do in battle and what counts is what indian navy is doing in battle and what china chinese navy or the pla and the pakistan navy put together despite having done an exercise here to do precisely this is not able to do it so this is what the message which should be going back to the them is so we have now discussed all five of these things i'd like to first put uh, you know get back to the first map and i would like you to explain the implications the strategic implications of these five rattles which you have done against china over to the map sir yeah see the first of you yeah yeah all and all of you when you look at all this and that's the primary reason why this article was written the one which we are referring to it was written because i was observing there was a time when we were very we were very active and the on the continental side absolutely inactive on the in the maritime front we had nothing we had no strategy on the maritime front we had created the andaman nicobar command etc but we had not really gone about em- carrying out that empowerment right we did participate in anti piracy operations earlier and did perform very reasonably well at that time but this time is something quite different this whole thing of uh, uh giving way as if you know the in perception which was being created was that as if we have been outmaneuvered in this whole issue of the maldives i think that needed to be corrected that perception needed to be corrected that we've been outmaneuvered completely then the aspect that we are technologically deficient and technologically far behind china particularly in the nuclear field in the missile field no doubt china with the second artillery etc has always scored a, a a point over us internationally but here it was necessary to show that in this domain the continental the maritime the technology domain it was ne- and now particularly in the infrastructure domain and lastly in the human resource deployment de- the domain of deployment in uh, eastern ladakh which was of course misread by them in all these five areas if you really look at it a very important all encompassing strategic message has been conveyed number 1 we are not being provocative number 2 we have the capability right and we can defend our interests when required we will push back and push back strongly whenever it is felt necessary to do so and we should not be taken for granted we know how to retain our interests it is not necessary that we are part of one side or the other side india will independently take its decisions and not be influenced by any third power as to our own strategic interests and if i just may add i would like to add this is a message i think which is a larger international community also must take into account gdps don't fight it's people who fight militaries fight and in that and militaries think and militaries execute in that we have come about very strongly so i will now we have finished all our five issues but i would like to add a few things where you know along with these five issues certain interesting things i came to know you know which would rattle china which would start them making things just think this is again i didn't know this all these came out from south china morning post their view He says, "Look, India's JMR Group is a potential fa- uh, front runner for a US three billion Manila port project amid China tensions. And now Philippines is giving the project likely to us, and they are not giving it to China. That is the main thing. And this comes when the tension going on in Philippines. So you can imagine the effect it is going to have. Then, if you see, look at the economy, Morgan Stanley." the composite index it has cut dozens of chinese stocks from its global benchmark indices and it has raised india's weightage to record high in fact if you go into it they morgan stanley has excluded 66 chinese stocks right which is very important and the weightage to india has increased and china has decreased so if you see apart from those five six things these are the things in the background which we so what are you putting across is your comprehensive national pushback i don't call it power pushback and then you look at this 
is very important and interesting this is reported by a, uh, you know associated press ap tibetans have marched in india on the anniversary of you know the tibet uh, the kampa rebellion uprising where they have said china to leave tibet where have they done near delhi's parliament house and this was something which has never you know for a long time it was not encouraged it has now restarted now it this gives a message of its own overall sir before we take a few questions what you have put across some additional issues and now these things which are coming from their side how do you think china starts viewing india now you see i take the context of april may 2020 and i and i insisted at that time i kept on writing and kept on remaining sort of uh, rooted to that uh, rationale which i was following why did china do what it did in april may 2020 uh, despite the fact that uh, our prime minister had gone out of his way to build the relationship uh, look at economics as the major factor and he had everything going with the chinese president etc and we were surprised out of the blue I don't pay too much of attention to COVID and things like that. I just pay look at the aspect that what was rattling China at that time is actually becoming a reality today. What was real? What was the what was rattling China at that time was the propensity which India was displaying of rising beyond just being a middle power, or even we were still not really a full middle power, but at least going beyond the middle power. Right? They knew we had the leadership. the current prime minister has displayed that kind of leadership we had the econo- economy going at that particular time we seem to be looking at technologies we seem to be looking at modernization it would be a matter of time before china before india became an alternative pole to china within asia if not that it should be around the world even altogether that is what was rattling them at that time and they felt that they could needle us they could convey a message to us to you know cow down and not have that that intent of trying to match china in terms of its of comprehensive national power and everything else right by doing this what china has achieved is actually the opposite of what it wanted to opposite do. yeah that's exactly the point <laughs> exactly the, point. the opposite of what we did it has it has actually given india the strategic muscle capability ability to push back look for the right partnerships around the world right and believe in ourselves i think a very important aspect is that belief which we we, we seem to have lost after 62 which seem to have returned now after a long oh. long time it seems to have returned now right i am not being provocative i'm the last one who would want to see anything in in terms of a deterioration in a relationship between india india and china i think both have their importance in the world both can survive this entire situation together and be actually be partners but by trying to keep india in what i mentioned in my article also by trying to keep india in the gray zone of whether china is a friend an adversary right a collaborator or a partner china is not achieving anything at the yeah. end of the day what is going to happen is that india will treat it more as an adversary and the pushback is not going to give china any advantage over us and if i may just add sir what china did in 2020 and i've discussed this across a lot of people they have turned it has turned the indian youth against it it's the next generation you and i might have the vision and the maturity to come to some understanding with china but the next generation of our youth the this nation's youth might not have that you know uh, kind of a feeling to even get on to some kind of some kind of a deal with china if it, if it comes in the future so i think they, china has a lot to ponder and rightly so the way they are reacting uh, indicates that they are a bit more than rattled uh so uh, can we take a few questions yeah, yeah, definitely, with your definitely. permission Not to have a few questions, yes. yeah yeah uh the first question sir is the upgrade of an area headquarter to a uh, core uh, command in the central sector is a step in the right direction to securing the forward oblique high altitude positions your views sir uh akash sir 
Uh, I'm glad you, you, you've touched upon a point which we did not really look at from that angle. But being military people, perhaps we didn't uh, sort of accord so much of importance to this. This particular area headquarters, which is the Uttar Bharat area located at Bareilly, um, is virtually like a core size formation, but it doesn't have maybe supporting forces along with it and things like supporting arms and things like that. But a lot of reconfiguration and a reorbiting has taken place in the central sector, which is the Himachal and the Uttarakhand sector. Now there are sufficient troops there. I'm not going to outline. I'm not going to quantify what troops are there. There are sufficient troops there today. Earlier, they were not, right? And to have an effective command and control, yes, a core headquarters with its uh, necessary support elements in the near future, which I'm sure will come about, will actually add tremendous weight to our overall defensive capability here. We may not have a, too much of an offensive capability. We do have some offensive capability, not too much. But uh, definitely, with the reconfiguration, a core headquarters, not a command, it's a core headquarters there, under headquarters central command, which is at Lucknow, and in the future, you never know the theater, you know, the northern theater or what is called the eastern theater could very well be located at Lucknow. This will form a very important part of that headquarter itself. At that time. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question, sir, uh, it's to you. In terms of wartime geographical advantage in a China-India future conflict, the nature favors which side for the soldier, whether in the western sector, central and the eastern sector? I mean, we can see for well, one thing for sure. Here. One thing for sure is that the Himalayan zone overall has a terrain advantage on the other side. You know, you know, the flatter portions there. Of course, you have to rise up and climb the uh, Tibetan plateau from the Chinese side. And once you are on the Tibetan plateau, you have a roll, open rolling planes all along. Use of armor, logistics is that much easier. Constructing air strips, landing strips, constructing airfields, all that becomes that much simpler in terms of infrastructure. For us, go to Ladakh and see yourself. Uh, go to Tawang and, and uh, the area of, uh, of uh, coming uh, or anywhere rest of Arunachal Pradesh. It's a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge for us, no doubt. But uh, notwithstanding that, the Indian Army has gone overboard in trying to overcome all those terrain challenges, right? The, I would say the manner in which the strategic airlift took place, for example, in uh, the month of April, May 2020, when uh, 14 Corps was reinforced to a strength of about 60,000 troops deployed there, 50 to 60,000 troops deployed there, all took place in a period of about two months, right? Again, with, with the terrain completely laid out against you, right? Fortunately, today, we are meeting those challenges. New airfields are coming up. Many more roads are coming up. More tunnels are coming up. And in terms of the LAC itself, habitat, infrastructure for the habitat, for ammunition dumps, for helipads, etc. All this has been constructed today. And although it's been taking a tremendous toll of our, of our economy, we were spending tremendous amount of money, capital expenditure on all this. But then ultimately for the motherland i suppose the defense of the motherland all this is absolutely necessary yeah i'd like just to add one issue because a lot of issues about this terrain the better terrain in china you know flatter terrain in tibet and ours is a very steep approach to the himalayan crest line keeps coming up and i've written about this also sir uh, if you just think any offensive from china to our side starts concentrated but once you cross the Himalayan crest line, it gets dissipated. You don't reach uh, convergence. Whereas from the Indian side, this is something for the future for our military commanders to think. When we go from here, you start dissipated. But actually, when you cross the crest line, you end up converging on to points. So this is a differential which you know many people don't understand. This is not to say that we're going to do uh, offensive and all. But who knows in future how we think, you know, and having overcome, having overcome the difficult part of the terrain, we are going into easier terrain. For them, having overcome the, the easier part of the current terrain are going to enter the difficult part of the terrain. 
So that is where the terrain balance comes in. The Air Force, really remember the air advantage, the advantage air of force. the Indian Air Force of its ability to take mm. off from airfields which are at much yeah. lower altitudes and therefore have their full um, weight capability to uh, their, all their ammunition, uh, arsenal of ammunition with them to carry. Yeah. Uh, this was it, Sain says, sir. Jai Hind, sir, by not getting involved in anti pirate operations despite presence in Djibouti. Is China avoiding showing their troop capabilities or its sheer lack of it? Your thoughts, sir? I think it's avoiding. It's avoid. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> I would love to conclude that they are avoiding it for the sake of not perhaps letting themselves down. They are not a very experienced. As I told you, banging uh, Philippines and Vietnamese uh, uh, boats here and there, gunboats here and there, is not naval power, right? But yes, and I would still, I would also say that not fighting against pirates is not CPAR, but these pirates have shown their propensity to do what, what they can. Over the last 15 years, they've shown this. And the, it's only the Indian Navy which has, which has actually displayed, demonstrated how capable they are. I think it would be a major comparison the moment you got reported in one fine day in the international media that a Chinese boat, a Chinese ship, has been targeted by the pirates and they were not found equal to fighting against the pirates and you found the Indian Navy up to it completely, it would be a huge letdown for the PLA. Huge hit. Yeah, I think so. And that day is to come. Okay. Exactly. That day is, the day of reckoning is ahead. Let's see what happens. Okay. Uh, thanks, Swamiji, for joining us as a member. Uh, right, sir. Let me see, take a new question. Okay. He says, do we need to again test our ASAT missile with ASAT and MR? We have completed our triad to launch missiles from land, sea, and air. Thank you. Uh, so, this is a developing, this yeah, is developing technology. Developing thing, yeah. And uh, look, we don't, we don't have a complete yeah. triad. The next thing, you know, is we have the asset capability. You have a MIRB capability. You have a MIRB capability from land. What is the next? You have to put this MIRB on in a submarine so that you have a viable triad. And for that, this MIRB has to be mated with a K series of missiles, the Kalam series of missiles which are going on. So that is, uh, you know, a different thing altogether. Uh, but you don't have to revisit this all over again. Okay. Uh, Saikat says, should we build military pressure on Maldives not to endanger our security with the, with the help of China? So it's a straightforward Why? question, but I think we I need to be it. very clear. You don't have to go, um, you know, kinetic on every small threat which develops. This is no threat which has developed against you. Yes, there are potential threats which are there. You don't have to start... Uh, treating it like an anti-terrorist situation where you go in rattling with your AK-47, right? India is a mature country. We are a big, or we are an emerging big power, right? And we know how to handle these things. I think the manner in which the government of India and very, very adequately have, have uh, dealt with this situation, you find our uh, external affairs minister every other day, somewhere or the other, I think this is very good uh, uh, in, in influence operations, information warfare, you're always talking about this, right? You're always talking about it, justifying our Indian actions, etc. I think that's, that is sending home an adequate message. You don't adequate have to message. go and, yeah, you don't have to unnecessarily sort a fly with a, with a hammer as such. All right. Uh, China is exploiting our fault lines by supporting insurgencies. Why we cannot exploit uh, China's fault lines? Now, to my mind, so far, China has not been able to actually exploit our fault lines to the degree that they could have, perhaps, right? And they are being careful about it. They don't want to get themselves involved too much. Northeast, at one time, if you remember in the good old years, the overall um, Maoist involvement, at the time of Mao's China, etc., things were very different, right? But ever since then, the Chinese hand in both the Red Corridor and thing has been comparatively limited. And uh, I would say, well, I don't, I'm not sure whether this is a deliberate 
thing on their part or not. But uh, the two and a half fronts that we talk about, the half front which we speak of is not at reason, is not completely the Chinese hand that we talk about. Is much more the Pakistani, much more the Pakistani. Islamic radical hand that we, we talk of in, in, the, in that particular case. So in this case, I'm not sure whether we need to respond to this. We need to do something in terms of, you know, taking the battle into China, etc. Let us adequately concentrate on our Western front. I think we are doing reasonably well there. Let's continue with that. So the last question for the day. Uh Providing can providing such important information with such a good explanation over the internet by army experts be dangerous in the hand of China? Very good question. And and if you if you and Shankar remembers uh, uh, after one of our discussions the last time we discussed this issue we, between we all the about. panelists. We discussed it between the panelists. I'm yeah. of the belief. I'm of the belief. We are mature enough. We know what we are saying, and we know how much we are saying. You heard me in the middle. When the issue of UB, UB area came up, the core headquarter, new core headquarter, I held back my information. I did not talk about it, although I'm aware of what is there, etc. I did not hold back. So, what we are actually doing is enhancing Indian strategic culture. We are making you aware of things. We are making, we are aware of how far to go to distribute knowledge among the Indian people, where I feel there's an emerging, huge emerging interest in strategic affairs and not enough takers to actually go ahead and, 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 and you know, satisfy that, that emerging hunger at the moment. So I think, trust us, we know exactly what we are doing at the moment. And not only that, if you've seen all each issue, I have preceded by what China has thought about it. So there's nothing new we are telling and China for the great army it is it you have to respect your opponent would also think the same way we are thinking i mean for what we have told you i'm sure that that is public knowledge in china also and they would be feeling right the thing which general hasnain that article which he wrote that's why i lashed on to him the moment yesterday i saw that article i said sir we should do this show i want to bring it out because like he said you know all this in peace, in piecemeal. Okay, we talk of string of pearls. When that fellow goes to Bangladesh, you say string of pearls. You go to, he goes to Myanmar, you say string of pearls. When we do all this, what is this? You built a shield and the shield is expanding. And it is expanding and whom is it going to squeeze? You're going to squeeze China. So we are not telling anything. What General Hasnan said, absolutely right. Look, he was my co-commander. I was his dev commander. Okay. He, okay. And we know. We, we know what we're talking and what you're doing. You have to trust us for it. At least the Indian Army trusted us for us for the best part of our 40 years. So you have to trust us for it. So your last words and then we'll uh, close down. Sir. Uh, well, uh, let me say first of all that I must compliment John Shankar for having picked up this article. Let me tell you, it didn't take me very long writing this article. There about three, four hours I did spend on it, but it excited me a lot. You know, when you see these developments taking place around you and you find that people are not linking up all these, everyone was writing about this, everyone was talking about it. The tele Indian television was talking about it as individual uh, items here and there. I got the idea of putting it together. John Shankar got excited by it and that's how we had conceived this whole program today. I think it's important for us to see in strategic terms to see a thing holistically. There is no point just looking at a segment of the border and start reacting to that. No, let's look at the whole thing, the entire picture, covering from Djibouti and going up to uh, up to the uh, Straits of Malacca, right up to the north and of Ladakh. We covered the whole thing, entire thing. And, and that's where, that's the importance of looking at strategic affairs. Don't look at anything piecemeal. Look at, look at them holistically. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, and I must thank you once again. You triggered something and, you know, you wrote something very outstanding, which just excited me. And uh, I we just put in something. I thought it was a tremendous show. And we I thought we also got some fantastic questions. And those of you who Absolutely. have not been able to answer, uh, you know, whose questions we have not been able to answer, Put these questions down in the uh, question, you know, comments box in the main thing. And in one of those updates, I will answer all those questions separately. 
I'll take all your questions which are interesting and answer it question. Interesting. The last thing before I close, I want to say, you know, in everything we need balance. And we need balance is very important in life. And what today we've achieved is the balance against China. And it's very significant that we are achieving, we are showing this balance against China on a day. Today is the equinox. What is equinox? Where the day and the night are the same time. And the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. East, west. Actually, any other day of this, it is off. You know, we are transiting from the winter time to the summer time. This is called the summer solstice. And it's a good thing today, sir. On a day where everything, nature is in balance, we are talking of also the strategic balance which we are achieving. <laughs> right? Uh, I think with this, we'll close down, sir. Uh, thanks a lot to everyone. Thank you, sir. Jai Hind to you and have a very good evening, sir. Jai Hind to everyone. Thank you very much for this wonderful show. Thank you, sir.